It doesn't matter what rank you have, what trade you have. If you have the aptitude to learn digital and data and analytics skills, we want to train you. Hi, this is Captain Adam Morton with the Canadian Army Podcast. And this episode is going to be about the digital army. Everybody in the military has at some point in their careers experienced the frustration of trying to move a memo or some piece of paper up and down the chain of command and encountered all sorts of problems along the way as we face down the barrel of bureaucracy. With me today, I have two guests. They're trying to change the way we do business so that all of this stuff can happen in the digital realm. Lieutenant Colonel Chris Marshall and Lieutenant Colonel Tom McMullen. Welcome to the podcast, gentlemen. Hey, Adam. How are you? Hey, Adam. Great to be here. They're both from the Canadian Army headquarters here in Ottawa, and uh, we're going to be talking a little bit more about this uh, topic. So maybe just for the people on the ground right now, what does this all mean? Lieutenant Colonel McMullen? Yeah, so I, I guess, Adam, uh, great question. And it's, it's a lot of things. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different buzzwords getting tossed around. Digital transformation, digitalization, digitization. At the end of the day, I mean, it's how does the Canadian Army adapt to the current operating environment? And by operating environment, not only in terms of operational and tactical and, you know, the business we have to do for our mission sets, but also here in the headquarters, institutionally, in terms of how do we plug into society at large? Because society has been undergoing this digital change over the last the last generation, really. And the Army's behind. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. Uh, people realize when they go to work uh, within Army units, they're kind of going through this time warp where they're going back in time and they're using processes and, and equipment and tools that are really designed uh, for 20 years ago. So that's really the the key message here is, is the Army needs to adapt and evolve, call it digital transformation, call it what you want, but we need to get with, with the current times uh, so that we can remain operationally effective for what we're asked to do. Well, thank Colonel Marshall. Did you want to add to that? Yeah, thanks, Adam. Uh, thanks, Tom. Um, Absolutely changes in the air. If you look at what's going on culturally, if you look at what's going on uh, in the digital space, you know, the commander has two priorities right now. And my understanding is that his priorities are that of changing army culture, uh, as well as getting after digital. So why can't we do these both at the same time? Um, I think digital collaboration is the way of the future, flattening communications as best we can to get the message out to people soonest. But if I, if I look at the Army uh, culture and conduct order that just dropped, like there's four phases to that. So it's listening, understanding, acting, and assessing. And this is what we have to do to get after digital today. So what are we talking about here? You know, more apps. I mean, I think some of the challenges that some of the troops are facing also is like we have a lot of these different platforms with Office 365 now being in place. And then you have ASIMS, which is uh, more on the defense network and things like that. Lieutenant Colonel Marshall. How are we going to make that a little bit more functional for the people using them? Hey, this is a great question, Adam. Uh, This is something my team and and that of the Army IMOs are gripped with every day. Uh, We have two information environments we're trying to maintain. You know, is it it necessarily uh, information management problem that we need to solve today? Um, I would argue the answer is actually yes. Uh, and, and it's something we're going to push for as part of Regi, as our army reconstitution of information management. The bottom line, we're fractured. We have two information environments. We have ASIMS, we have Defense 365, you know, and that's just on the unclassified side. So how do we bring those together? I think that's where we need really smart people uh, like the Signals Corps to come in and help us uh, get that sorted out. Uh, the sooner we can bring those environments together, uh, the better. Yeah, and I also say on that, like, it's easy to knee-jerk reaction and to say, oh, add another system. Um, and we've all seen this before. Like, we're trying to solve problems by adding on top of the pile we already have. Uh, so, like Chris said, we need to start converging and removing things. But it's not just the systems and the IT pieces. And people all automatically default to that when they think digital. They think, oh, it's the tools and it's the, it's the systems. But it's really, it's the process and it's the people uh, and it's the culture and it's uh, how we think about things. And just because, you know, the process we currently have and the way we're structured doesn't mean those things, uh, there's no sacred cows, right? We can't change those things. So um, it's a classic example of the leaf pass process. And, you know, you put your leaf pass in, uh, you used to have to print it, sign it, send it across the chain of command and then get to the or- orderly room. Well, now we've digitized that, sure. We're using monitor mass or we're using whatever it is, PKI signature, 
and sending a PDF, but the process is still the same. So we're not really using the full kind of potential of these digital tools uh, because we're we're still a bit handcuffed with the existing processes. Uh, so it's really rethinking the way we do our business. I like that uh, you used you know the very concrete example of the leave pass because uh, I think everybody in the military has some story of submitting a leave pass and then going through this process and kind of disappearing behind a desk or something like that. And it, it's a, sometimes it's a challenge. And, and that's something that, you know, in the modern era, a pretty easy challenge to overcome with only a couple of easy changes, which we've already started implementing. Speaking a little bit more to the, uh, you know, process of kind of creating this change, um, you talked about, uh, you know, listening. Lieutenant Colonel McMullen, what's being done right now to kind of determine the scope of that challenge and and how are we listening? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, this is part of it is getting the message out. Um, so in my day job within the headquarters, primary responsibility is, um, is looking at capability development and all these projects that are coming online in the C4ISR space in the next 10 years. But on the side, and this has really been an initiative through General Ayat and Chief of Army uh, Strategy, is getting a tiger team together. So we've gotten this tiger team from all kind of aspects of the army. There's divisional representation, representation across the army headquarters to really scope out the problem space. You know, I think Einstein said this, if you have a, if you had a problem, you know, I would spend uh, 90% of the time looking at the problem space and 10% of the time applying the solution set. So we're still very much in that problem space development making sure we understand the problem, but also uh, we have a bias to action and we want to start getting these quick wins, getting some momentum going. Um, so the past six months, we've been looking at the problem space. We've been looking at culture, some of the challenges we have right now, the frustrations, the systems we have, the processes, and also where we want to be. And now it's a matter of really getting a roadmap in terms of where we are today, the start line, and where we want to be. And that that's going to be the journey we're going to be on. Ideas have no rank. So we need input from the collective army. We actually need to do a better job of getting the word out that this is actually going on. So it is part of the Canadian Army modernization strategy. So that call to action is getting uh, sent across the army, but hopefully it gets filtered down to the right levels because we really need this input. Yeah, uh, and I just want to acknowledge like the great work the Digital Tiger team has done uh, in bringing together that sort of first level operational strategic level view of of where we need to go. Um, in tandem, uh, I'm working with with Tom as a fire team partner, where we're trying to uh, get some early wins and and see where we can find economies of effort to inform what decisions we have to make in our investment thesis to get after a digital army. Um, so between Tom and I, you know, we're, we do this quite happily because we know that this is going to make a better army one day for us. But yeah, this is the listening phase. And, and part of the listening phase is not just listening to what the people have to say to us as what they would like to see change. Uh, we all want the easier leave pass, absolutely. Um, but at the same time, we have to listen to what the data is telling us. We have all this great data and, and I need people to come work for us that are able to be able to see through the problem set and extract those insights in the data so we can better understand the problem. So speaking of getting the right people in the right place to help with this, is anything being done to try and get those people? Because surely within the army, you have a lot of people, people are multi-talented, you have infantry soldiers who have backgrounds in information management or whatever. How are you getting the people to where they need to be? So the Canadian Army is partnering with an Australian-based firm where we're able to hire folks with data and analytics skills. Uh, there's a few things that we're doing with them. First is providing data and analytics training to members of the Canadian Army. A message has gone out on social media and through your chain of command. So if you're interested in learning more about data and analytics and getting some more skills for your resume, uh, please sign up and do the training. As well, when we have a digital sort of future-focused workforce, we're now enabling CEOs to self-solve their digital capability gaps. Our friends in the Australian Army invested in this space very early, and now they have data analysts at each down to unit level across their entire army. I think we need to do the same in our army. And it doesn't matter what rank you have, what trade you have, if you have the aptitude to learn digital and data and analytics skills, we want to train you. And surely uh, we'll put the link in the show notes. So if people are interested, they can definitely have a look at that uh, themselves. And I will say as well, like, I guess 
the current way we're structured and uh, the way we can look at a person's NPR or their their background and their qualifications, you know, we'll be able to tell if a soldier has their QL3 and they have whatever education, but it's sometimes tough to see, you know, who has aptitudes for data analytics. There's um, a bit of a test. It'll determine right away if you have an aptitude for it. And it's not the typical thing where you think it's going to be people with programming background or technical background. It's really people with, you know, creative uh, thinking and thinking outside the box and some of these things. So that's that's really, we're trying to like find and mine this talent throughout the army. You know, with all of the soldiers that we have throughout the army, there's so much talent out there. How do we unlock and find that talent? And they can start working on problems at a local level and start solving local problems. Chris, do you have any thoughts on this? Well, one of the early insights we gained is that Folks in the combat arms who may not be viewed as the best to move into a digital realm uh, actually are the best at abstract reasoning and working in 3D spaces, which are very, very important aptitudes if you're going to work in uh, data and digital. So I would challenge everyone to at least try the test. And the great thing is when you're done at the end of the test, it will actually advise uh, based on your personality, your archetype, your aptitude, whether or not you can go into like uh, cyber data or um, an engineering type skill set. So you have a program that's kind of developed to uh, identify people who have certain aptitudes in these fields. Um, we're going through the listening process right now. You've been speaking a little bit about early wins. Are there any other uh, successes that have kind of moved the ball forwards and towards achieving these goals that we have set out? Absolutely. Um, one of the early wins, I would say, that uh, has come through uh, Director Army staff and the Canadian Army headquarters is the establishment of an analytic support center. Um, we, we have people on the ground now that, that are able to collect the problems that are out there, uh, you know, the shout out to the ASIMS analytics portal uh, where you can submit your problems and have people um, work on it for you. But uh, yeah, that is one of the first early things that has come out. Anything else you want to add? Uh, I'll more? just say on that, yeah, the data analytics hub, that is something that uh, we got support on actually from a kind of higher government Canada initiatives and the uh, Canadian School of Public Service. They have a digital accelerator program. Uh, we were able to get an army sponsored team over there and they were able to work on this uh, this problem over the course of a few months and develop this portal. Uh, so anybody throughout the Army is able to submit uh, through this portal a problem, a data analytics problem they want to have worked on. And then uh, it, it's great. At least we're, we're tracking some of the problems that are out there. And we're able to kind of have that single front door from which we can kind of input these things. Because otherwise, you know, it's easy for us in the Army headquarters to try to think about the problems that the divisions and the, the units have out there. We just don't know. And, it, you know, a problem at a unit in Edmonton is not going to be the same problem of a unit in, in Valkyrie or Halifax. We understand that. But that's the power of digital is some of these problems are the same. Some of the solutions can be applied the same. So if a great solution is innovated somewhere in Halifax and, hey, we can apply it across to the rest of the Army, uh, why not? There's the power of digital right there. Lieutenant Colonel Marshall, can you give me an example of a problem that Army analytics could be solving? Yeah, absolutely. One of the most exciting problems I think that we're working on right now is uh, getting a better understanding of Army readiness. Not that we don't know what it is, but it is such a complex subject. It's not like we're sending a frigate out into the ocean or a plane over here. The Army uh, is, and forwarding its land power, creates task-tailored capabilities to achieve a certain mission. And so when we design these capability packs, it requires different levels of readiness for different things. So readiness can be a very nebulous concept. And when you're trying to mine that um, through an ad hoc method, uh, it can be quite complex. Yeah, that's a great point, Chris. Yeah, yeah. And I also say readiness means different things. So there's the army readiness at, at large, but if you break it down into its pieces, you know, divisional readiness, brigade, unit. So a unit CO, you know, for an infantry uh, battalion is going to have a different uh, metric of readiness compared to, let's say, an EW squadron. Um, so that's where you can kind of personalize these things. And that's, again, that goes back a bit of the power of digital. It's not all one size fits all. You're able to take the different pieces of data and personalize it for your own purposes, whether it's within a unit, within a subunit, whatever. 
and you're able to give different metrics based on what you want to see. That's the power there. Just know we're not going to solve everybody's problem at the same time, but you're able to personalize your individual problem sets and make use of this shared kind of data that everybody has access to, but is going to use and visualize in different ways. So like if I think about, you know, it's not immediately obvious to understand if a mechanized company is ready to go and what the status of the labs are and the status of all the weaponry and the and the soldiers and all of that. We have processes now that exist where, you know, you're, you're sending up reports via Excel spreadsheets or whatever, you know, through email or whatever mechanism, but it's not as easy as going to a website and clicking a couple of buttons and saying, oh yeah, these battalions are at this percentage ready to go. You know, these tanks are at this percentage ready to go or whatever. And so by creating these systems, we can have a better idea of where we sit. And it hasn't been that easy up to that point. Is that a fairly accurate summary of this as a concept? Yeah. And if, if you just take that concept and apply it to, you know, the last 18 months that the Army's been participating in op laser. So readiness is something that we consume. Uh, we, we create readiness individually and collectively, and then we apply it to a problem set or mission at whatever the Army is asked to do of us. And so now with we've had such a high tempo over the last 18 months, being able to take that in-flight picture of what our readiness picture looks like today is going to be supremely important as we get ready for the problem sets of tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. you know, we have a good, accurate understanding of the in-flight picture, but we also have, an, we can extrapolate it out. And, you know, that's the power of data again, is to show where we're going, show the trends, you know, show where the different inputs we should be putting into course correct. But you brought up a good point, Adam, is like the mental model we have is, is very much based on the chain of command and the way the army is structured is let's take an Excel spreadsheet of uh, going from subunit to unit to a brigade all the way up to the army headquarters. And then you know, you're playing a bit of the telephone game. And by the time it gets to the army headquarters or the staff up there and the commanders that need to make a decision, is that data still accurate? Is it expired? Is it past due? You need to change a bit of the mental model where everyone should have access to this data. Everybody has got access to this data pool. As things are going in, it's, it's getting updated. And then the staff and the commanders are able to make decisions based off this data, but based on the decisions they need to make. Um, so you're now playing this telephone game of going up and down the chain of command. Yeah, so you're really changing a bit of the mental model of how people access and, uh, and use data for decision making. I appreciate the use of op laser for those that don't know, that's uh, the Canadian Armed Forces response to the COVID-19 pandemic and the frequent changes, you know, talking really quickly about parade state, you know, the sergeant sits down with their section and checks off who's available, who's not available in their situation. And again, that's one of those things that kind of makes its way up in emails. And that information is so flexible in an environment where you have something like COVID-19 where people may become unavailable because they're isolating or potential exposures or they're deployed or on task and those tasks require them to go through isolations. And that's moving so quickly that uh, when that information gets to the top level, it can be several days or weeks old and it's not always uh, easy to get a good picture of what's going on. Yeah, exactly. And that's the power right there. You get, you're able to get a dashboard for whatever level you want to see. You get a dashboard and you show, okay, across this organization, I have X people that are here, X people maybe that are out sick for whatever reason. And you're able to go back in history and look at some of the trends as well. So instead of having to rely on playing the telephone game and getting reports up, everybody is able to access that same kind of shared understanding. Talking a little bit more about kind of that, uh, assessment and training program, Lieutenant Colonel Marshall, what kind of training is available to them once they've gone through this kind of assessment model? Yeah, there's lots of options in terms of the training libraries available. We have initially 25 seats a month on our initial boot camp, then we're looking to grow that out as demand increases. But uh, once you get out uh, of the basic data boot camp, you can get into robotics process automation, visualizations of data, database analysts, database engineering. It can go on and on. We're, we're looking for people that have experience with cloud as well, uh, where we're looking to explore some of the uh, Azure cloud uh, options available to us um, through Defense Today. Yeah, this training is giving you the basics, kind of the fundamental 
uh, building blocks. And then with those ingredients, folks are able to go away and use tools such as in the Microsoft suite. I know Power BI is a big one of being able to take a bunch of data that comes in, let's say on Excel spreadsheets. Well, we're now able to, to take this, manipulate that data and visualize it in different ways. So that's a bit of, a, of the preview there. And again, these tools are all, they're being used in industry. They're being used outside of the Canadian Army. Um, so they have been kind of vetted and it's things that if folks think they have an aptitude for data analytics and for doing uh, this kind of thing, it's kind of a free and easy thing uh, to go through and then just kind of confirm that they have the, these aptitudes. So I guess the next question is what comes after this? What's, uh, what's the next step? So the next step is exactly what Tom and I are working hard on with the digital target team and uh, with that of our chain of command. Once we get access to our data understanding uh, of the Army layer, we'll then take a look at our capability roadmaps. We need to make some very hard decisions about where we're going to divest and invest as a Canadian Army and be able to achieve the Canadian Army modernization strategy. Yeah, and at the same time, I mean... The more we can find and kind of mine the talent that we have within the army, it gives commanders a better sense of, oh, we have all of this talent out there that's that's kind of untapped right now. And even at the, at the local level, and that, that's something that comes up over and over is if you're a unit CO, why would you let one of your soldiers do this training? And then they're just, if they're really good at it, they're just going to be pulled over by uh, army headquarters to work on our problems. Well, right. no, like we're, <laughs> we're not looking to poach anybody and we understand that's an issue. So it's... Okay, let's invest in in our soldiers. Let's give them the training to fulfill their their kind of potential. But they can be working on these local problems that unit COs have. Like if the unit CO wants to create a a digital dashboard um, instead of using whatever tools they're currently using, then let's untap that talent within their unit. The model is a bit of like the Uber model: is that you have all of these Uber drivers out there, and you have all of these problems. There are people looking for rides. Well, let's match up these people that can work on the problems to the problem sets themselves. And that's kind of that micro work model we're looking at with Chris of, of achieving here is uh, is matching the talent towards the problems that we have. And I think the trick here, Adam, um, as Tom kind of expressed, is we need to take some of our core army skills and imbue it into what we're trying to do today. Uh, one of my favorite ones, I remember one of the first things I heard when I actually signed up uh, at the Ontario Regiment back in 2001 was like, you know, our number one job is to take care of our friends. And and so if we take that, and how do we take care of Buddy with the data and digitization? Well, why don't we just build the problem set for everyone and then just cut out the piece of the pie that we need? So using the slice and dice, as we like to call it, right? So if I have a problem with understanding how many vehicles are ready in my unit today, there's a good chance that the person on the other side of the country has the same problem. So why don't we just build a solution, create those economies of effort, and, and just standardize it across. And I think that's one of the big leadership points that Army Headquarters is going to have to get after is how we standardize this uh, to solve all of our problems in, in, a, in, a, in a quick and efficient way. All right. Well, thanks very much for taking the time to explain us kind of the problem space we're working in and uh, what we got going to make it better. Thanks for coming to the podcasters. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Adam. Great. That was Lieutenant Colonel Chris Marshall and Lieutenant Colonel Tom McMullen talking to us about the digital army. If you have an interest in being a participant in this change, uh, you can take a look at the website attached in the show notes and you can go through the testing yourself and see where your aptitudes lie. As usual, I'm Captain Adam Morton for the Canadian Army Podcast. Orton out. Orton out.